Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grace County Baptist Church. Would you all stand with us as I do our call to worship this morning? So I will be reading uh, Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3, uh, which begins like this. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groan. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for, for to you do I pray. O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Amen.
fellowship together and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we can worship the Lamb of glory. We are God's, part of God's redemption story for us, Lord, and the work you did on the cross. God, I pray that you would help us to leave all of our worries and our trouble and sickness that seems to be plaguing the area at the moment. Start with the work. Lay it at your feet. Help us to worship with our whole heart and our whole mind. That you would be glorified and honored. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen. Nina, thank you in your prayer for just, let's do that. Let's leave all those distractions and everything at the door. And uh, come to the table unhindered by these things. I want to invite you today to come to the table, those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrate communion together. You'll, you'll be served where you're seated, don't worry. But I want to invite you to participate. And uh, we're going to celebrate in communion and encourage you to just think for a moment briefly about what it is the Lord has accomplished in doing, uh, creating this for us. I shared uh, last service with this idea. I, I walked into first service very scattered this morning. As you may have not noticed looking around, a number of people in our church are out not feeling well, um, like substantially to the effect that I wasn't sure how we were going to pull off church this morning. Half our worship team's out sick, coffee wasn't getting made, uh, there was literally nobody to teach Sunday school, but that's okay because nobody actually came to Sunday school this morning. And that's not a great thing, but that just is the state of how not well so many people are um, and so for those of you who are well, I'm going to pray that you stay well and uh, that, that that maintains being the case. It's been a crazy, crazy time. I was driving back from Portland with Jacob yesterday, and my phone just started to ding. So many dings of so many situations of people just starting to report in. I'm not feeling well. I can't do slides. I'm not feeling well. I can't make coffee. I'm not feeling well. I won't be there for Sunday school. I'm not feeling well. I can't teach Sunday school. In the last week and a half, I have had five teachers to cover Sunday school this morning. But it wouldn't have mattered because in the Lord's provision, he knew we didn't need a teacher. So it all worked out fine. We'll, we'll just get that adult class started next week when everybody's alive and well and can come. Um, and so that's a good thing. And so we just praise the Lord. But as Nina prayed, there are many not well. But for those of us who are here, we've come to the table. But we come to the table in a sense because we're not well spiritually. We need the Lord Jesus' covering, his body broken, his blood shed for us. So today I want to invite you to come with a sense of peace. And just I'm going to uh, give us a moment to pray together as we just uh, help center our thoughts and our minds on what the Lord has done for us in communion. The Lord Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. And a couple of weeks ago we celebrated Palm Sunday. And I really liked what uh, A.J. Uh, did for us in helping us understand by and I love the photo he showed of the little passion play that a very earnest church had done somewhere at some point in time and the the characters are wearing you know t-shirts and and they've got their their uh, proverbial sashes over their shoulders you know we all run to Joanne's and I need a slosh uh, uh, six feet of dirty fabric and that's what we wrap around ourselves and there were six or seven of them in the photo when the reality is Jesus Entering Jerusalem on a donkey was a massive political statement that he is the rightful king. And in so doing, tens of thousands of people came out onto the streets to welcome the new king into Israel. The current king? Not so excited about that situation. And the disciples in Jesus find themselves a few days later in an upper room where Jesus is going to inaugurate what we're about to do, communion. And they're hiding because a bounty is out. At any moment, any one of them could have been executed on the street for treason, for Jesus to have declared himself the king. Thousands of people welcomed him into the city, and there they were, the 12, 13 of them total, huddled in a room. And Jesus holds up a cup. All right, he holds up first the bread. His body will be broken. And the disciples probably are thinking, oh, good. If that's all that happens, we will have gotten away scot-free. And then later, he's going to hold up the cup, my blood shed. And I think that's when their heart's going to sink and the bottom drops out. Jesus is going to die. And they didn't understand the significance of what was going to happen, but you and I do.
because we can read the whole passage. I want to share with you what Paul writes to the church in Corinth and for us today as we think about communion. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup at the end of the supper and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of me as often as you come together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing today. We're proclaiming the Lord's death to one another until he comes in the days to come. We don't know when that will be, so we only know that today we need to be faithful. And then tomorrow when we rise, we, we need to be faithful. We just keep doing that daily after day, recognizing that when the Lord comes, he will find us faithful. And we celebrate the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the, the cup as a reminder to us of what Jesus has done for us on the cross for our sins. And so today I invite you to the table to come and participate in this reminder and this celebration of what God has done and is doing until the day he comes in his conclusion. With that in mind, would you join with me as uh, as we pray? The ushers will come forward and then you'll be served when you're seated. Hold the elements until all have been served and we will take them together and I'll lead us to them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this time to remember what you have done and are doing and will do in the future. Lord, I love that this season around the table, this moment, reminds us of the truth that you are working out the plan that you started long ago and will be bringing to conclusion in the days to come. My hope today, Lord, is that all who come to the table will be uh, refreshed and renewed and rejuvenated in knowing that our sins are forgiven. Lord, if there's a way in us right now that is wayward, would you help us to confess that to you? Help your spirit, Lord, to bring bring those things to mind that we may be convicted of them in these moments. That, Lord, we may lay them at the foot of the cross, knowing that the cross has covered our sin, his body broken, his blood shed. As we listen to music and as we mull over these things, we just pray that your spirit would speak to us. Raise these things up as we confess them to you this morning, Lord, so that when we come to the table, we do not do so in vain. We don't want to do that, Lord. We don't want to come to the table and and do it uh, flying in the face of your your sanctifying work. Lord, instead, we want to come humbly, uh, full of receiving your grace and mercy this day, Lord. So we thank you for these good truths today, Lord, and help us to rest in them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite our ushers to come forward. you had time to just pray to the Lord and think about these things. And now I want to invite you to take your cup and open the bread and hold that in your hand for a moment. Just think about what it was that Jesus held up to the bread at the table with his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken 
And um, it hadn't been broken yet, but it was going to be broken. And it was a, a, a premonition of what was to come. And his disciples were uncertain as to what all of this meant. But you and I today, we know. We know what the Lord is doing. And we know that his body was broken for you, for the world, so that you could take and eat in remembrance of him. Later on in the supper, Jesus held up the cup. I was just thinking to myself, I always kind of like it secretly when it's really bitter. Anybody love that like I do? Because you know what it reminds me? It leaves this bitter taste in my mouth. And what a bitter moment it was for Jesus when his blood was shed. Just that symbolism comes to life for me. And I think of when Jesus held up the cup in the supper, and you can go peel the top off of that off, and as Jesus held the cup and he showed it to his disciples, he made a show of it. This is the cup, this cup right here. But obviously not the cup itself. Um, Indiana Jones didn't understand that. It's what's in the cup that matters, right? It's, it's, and it doesn't matter if it's juice or or, or, um, or wine or vinegar or whatever it was. That, none of that really matters. What matters is the symbolism of what was imputed on him. This is my blood that is going to be shed for the world. And that, that is a game changer. That is a life-changing statement. Jesus' blood shed for you for the, for the remission of your sins. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, today we stand a people redeemed and thankful for what you have done for us on the cross. Your body broken, your blood shed for us. The music we sang today is the beautiful reminder of the story, of the fact that humanity is in this storm and that you come and you bring calm and peace to the chaos around us. That, Lord, you're the lamb who is um, given up for us. Lord, I think about the amazing grace that has been bestowed on us. And Lord, as I just rehearse those lyrics in my mind, they tell the story of what our Bible tells us, that your word reminds us, Lord, that your body was broken and your blood was shed, and that all of this happened because my sin put you on the cross. Our sin put you on the cross, Lord. Not just this vague idea of sin, but we, we did that, Lord, and we own that this morning. And we trust in the fact that, that in doing so, Lord, you did that with purpose, uh, on purpose, for the purpose of sanctifying and building up and encouraging your people. Today we are uh, re redeemed and loved and justified and sanctified and declared righteous. And Lord, all of these truths are evident in the way that we walk and live. And today we want to do that. Help us to live and to walk righteously in your ways, Lord. Father in heaven, Right now, there's a bunch of people in our congregation who are sick. Um, I don't know that I've ever gotten so many text messages the night before church. I pray, Lord, for all of those who are not well. Many of them may be watching now. And Lord, we just are thankful that we, in this 21st century, while not together in physical, can be together in spirit. Lord, I thank you and praise you for the work you're doing in our lives. We pray that while we're not together, we can ma maintain relationship. We thank you for these truths. There are some among us who are ill but are extra vulnerable. We pray for them especially this morning. Even though we desire wellness for everybody, we recognize that uh, Tony, in his older years, uh, that sickness is, is an extra issue for him. And so we just pray you'd protect him and preserve him from this uh, bug that's going around. I think of a few others who are just older and struggling to just bounce back after being sick. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to find energy and to be rejuvenated in the days to come. I thank you for our vulnerable uh, folks who are battling cancer. I think of Jeannie and Larry. We pray that you would either preserve them from being sick or, Lord, as I know Jeannie wasn't feeling well, that you are helping her to feel better every day. And I pray that this would not be a significant blow, but not something that would knock her down, but, Lord, just cause her to take a beat and be able to continue on. We pray for her, for Mike. I think of Larry and Maine, and we just ask, Lord, over those households that you would help them all to be well this morning. Lord, there's many others in our number who can't be with us on a regular basis, and we just continue to pray for their, their ailments as well. And Lord, there's just a lot of sickness, and at the underlying tone is we recognize that you are the healer and the great physician, and we thank you, Lord, for working in our lives in this way. Today, Lord, as we look to your word uh, uh, here in a few minutes, 
Lord, we're going to deal with a, a kind of a tough passage. And I just pray for your wisdom as we do that, that you would encourage us as we go along. Lord, we thank you for your goodness this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if the kids haven't already headed down, we are dismissing for Children's Church. And I uh, invite you to do that. And then I want to invite you to uh, pay attention to a couple of details that are coming up. Before I jump into the Word, I want to... I want to do a couple of things. I'm going to invite Becky to come up here in a moment. She's going to share about women's ministry stuff. Uh, come on up, love. And uh, actually, we'll just start with that. Looks like you're the first slide up. We'll take a moment. I just wanted to invite you all, of you ladies, on April 19th. Um, we're going to be doing kind of a unique event where we are going to be focusing on a Japanese art, as you can see in the picture. Um, but it's not a craft project. It's something that you'll be led through, and um, it symbolizes the brokenness in our lives and God's healing. So we're going to actually be taking bowls and breaking them and re-putting them back together as a symbol that you can keep. And we're going to be um, focusing on scripture and some of our life stories of how God has broken and mended us together and made us more beautiful as a result. So because of this, it's going to be reserved for ladies high school age up. It's not really appropriate for younger girls. Um, but we hope that you guys can come and just join us for this. It's going to be something really neat that Cindy Hansen is going to walk us through. So um, we hope you can come. And there's a sign-up sheet, not on this table, but if you go out to your left, there's another little counter. There's a sign-up sheet there and flyers. Excellent. Thank you. One of the things Becky didn't mention that I would just add to it is that you'll go home with this bowl, which will become a conversation piece in your household and an amazing tool for sharing with others how God mends our brokenness. And so just a neat thing to have at home and uh, a neat tool. Ladies, I'm excited. I might have to don a wig and a dress and come hang out with you. We'll see how that works out. But I think I might make the news, and that would be bad. So we don't want to do that. Uh, a couple other quick things. In the back of the chair in front of you, I hope, uh, the little guys, um, Red and um, his brother, Jed, Red and Jed, how could I not remember that? They were not here today to run through and stuff all the envelopes, so if you don't have a welcome card, a connect card, or a prayer card in front of you, look around, we'll, we'll work together, we'll get them there for you. But I want to encourage you this morning to um, let us know how we can be praying for you, uh, praises about what God's doing in your life, any of those kinds of things, go ahead and fill them out on that card, and then... On the connect side, I want to invite you to just, that's how you can sign up for stuff. That's how you can connect to the office if you're visiting with us. We'd love to be able to respond and just say welcome and hello and follow up. Or if you have questions or, or just need to connect with me and would like a call back, we can make all that happen. But that connect card is a great tool. And those can be handed to me directly or dropped in the offering box in the foyer as well. I want to remind, since I know quite a few people from our church are watching at home, uh, if you scan that QR code with your phone, it'll take you to our website, and there's a virtual connect card at the bottom of the first page. The other thing I want to remind you is that a lot of people who are at home need to sign up for stuff, and there's three ways to sign up for anything at our church. On the list in the foyer, using the connect card, or you can always call the church, and then we'll sign you up for you. Because I know a lot of people are not here to sign up, but we need you to sign up for the women's event coming up so we can plan ahead with materials. We need you to sign up for Sue Allen's party coming up. So uh, She's just been recently blessed with custody of two two-year-old boys, uh, twins. And uh, she was here this morning with the boys. They're super cute. And uh, she's, her life just flipped. And we want to support her doing a money tree shower kind of a thing. So just sign up for that so they can plan ahead for that. A couple other things going on. Abby, give me the next slide. I would love for you to sign up for our Discover class. I do this about once every eight to 12 weeks, and this is an opportunity for you to stick around after church for lunch. And I just wanna walk you through uh, who we are as a church, why we do what we do, why things are not the way you maybe want them to be, and we ask questions, we talk about all these kinds of things, and it's actually a lot of fun. And it's a great way for everybody to get to know each other better. And uh, I would invite you to come for that. This, be, being that we serve a lunch, I do need you to let me know you're coming though. That's really helpful. And so just go ahead and jot down on the sign-up sheet, use that Connect card, or give the church office a call. Sorry, you thought I was going, but I wasn't ready. It's all right, don't worry. Um, men, hey now, go back. Hey now. I think there might be auto-switching on her. Men's gathering tomorrow night. So remember, guys, how we all sat and we were like, hey, 
we should get together in April, but I didn't have a meeting scheduled, and now I remember why. Tomorrow night is the NCAA men's basketball final game. That's why we weren't going to get together. But guess what? Since you all want to get together, we're going to get together. We'll watch the game. We'll have the game on downstairs. We're going to do a big taco bar. A bunch of guys are going to be here to hang out. And then we're going to spend some time praying together as well. We don't want to miss out on that. And uh, it'll be a social, fun, hanging out time. And then at the end of April, go ahead, Abby. At the end of April, we're, I made her gun shy now. <laughs> at the end of April, uh, Dunes Bible Camp is hosting Dunes Bible Camp. I don't love the name, but it, it works. But anyway, guys, I want to invite you up for the weekend. We're going to do um, uh, a weekend, and it's the seven rhythms of a man's heart, I think out of one of the Psalms. And the part, it's not on the slide, the part that I'm thinking of. But all that to be said, guys, registration for, uh, I think the discount early registration is, I think, the end of the week. So if this is something you want to go to, I really want to encourage you to come. Uh, also, um, some guys are not real keen on sleeping in a dorm situation, or they can't give the whole weekend to it, that's okay. I know for sure we'll have a group of guys who just go up on the Saturday and just enjoy the day together and uh, come back down. So we'll make that happen as well. It's a great time for connection and encouragement, and I want to encourage you to come. There's flyers in the foyer. These are things you can find on our church website as well, and we'd be happy to, to, to do that together. So now with uh, all of that in mind, is there anything else that I need to talk about? I think that's it. Okay, let's move to the Word then. And uh, hear what the Lord has for us. I know it's not fun to do those in the middle of the service, but I also feel like uh, there's a lot going on, and we need to give them attention as part of our worship. This is doing church together, uh, doing these activities, supporting and ministering to the needs of others. I'm excited about the things and all the wonderful things the Lord's doing in and through our church. I want to invite you now, if you haven't already, to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're Thank you. We're continuing on in our series in Matthew 5, where uh, we're in Matthew 5, we're continuing on in our series of Matthew, we've hit the Sermon on the Mount. What I need to do for a moment, though, because we're going to be challenged with a very difficult subject today in Jesus' teaching on the Sermon, I've been wrestling with this now for several weeks, uh, how to approach these topics that are helpful for our church. Um, what I know is a couple of things. I cannot pack everything, I cannot unpack everything the Bible says on these two topics today. If you walk away feeling like, oh, I wish you had talked about such and such, I just, you know, you can't do everything in 25 minutes. I, I, I tried. And those become 45-minute sermons, and nobody likes those. And so I want to invite you this morning to just know, I know there are things that I'm leaving on the table. That's okay. Because what they do is they foster more conversation. They give us more opportunity to connect. And, and also, we're going to be revisiting this topic multiple times as we go through. I also want to share today, as I want to be faithful to this text, the text that is the subject of our preaching time today. I don't want to run all through the Bible. I'm not going to run you through the scriptures today to go look at the many other passages on these topics. What I want to do instead is I want to think very specifically about what these verses say on the topics of adultery and divorce, as we think about these, you know, what are really hot topics in our culture today. Um, instead, by doing that, what we're going to see is that Jesus' comments in this particular passage are a great foundation for us to build a theology of understanding around these two topics. And so I think that will be helpful for us this morning. And so in doing that, I want to start here. This is, I think, where we need to launch. The Sermon on the Mount is not about adultery and divorce. It's not about all of the little specific topics, okay? So what happens is we get this myopic view and we laser in on something. We laser in on, like today, the topic of adultery or the topic of divorce. Of divorce. And then what we do is we forget the context that all of this sits in. The context of the Sermon on the Mount is essential for understanding why Jesus is using these topics illustratively. And what matters for us this morning is that we need to understand that the central theme of the Sermon on the Mount is how to live righteous in Christ. Everything Jesus talks about, all the different topics of the Sermon on the Mount, always boil down to we must find true righteousness in Jesus alone. The alone, I should have underlined it. That's the word here, okay? Alone. Not in a bunch of stuff. 
We do not find true righteousness in being good people. We don't find true righteousness in doing certain things certain ways. We don't find true righteousness in doing the right things the right way. We find righteousness in Jesus alone. Only Jesus can make us righteous. Righteous is his right, right before God. Now, with that being the case, what we also learn and understand is that we must do then, we must do right things for right reasons, but here's the big difference, from the heart. It's an activity that begins in our transformation, putting on a new self, being made alive in Christ, transferred from darkness into light, that concept, the, the new work that God does in us, then trans transitions us from everything is in us going out instead of out there that we're trying to put in us. So righteousness of the Pharisees, that Pharisaical, I'm going to use this idea a lot, so this will be the, the juxtaposition that we're working through this contrast. The Pharisees were all about follow the rules, and that is behavior, doing good things that are right, but for the wrong reasons and not from transformation in the heart, but from trying to transform the heart. That's, that's self, self-help, self-will, bootstrap kind of theology. What we need to do instead is we need to pursue the righteousness of God as an activity that must start in our hearts where transformation actually takes place. The word heart, I'm not obviously talking about your physical heart. This is the euphemistic soul. This is the center of who you are. Uh, you must start with righteousness from who you are rather than trying to conform to something else that's not the way you are. And uh, we'll unpack this as we go along. But it's important that we pursue right things for right reasons from the heart that God has transformed in us. With that in mind, join with me. I want to read these passage in chapter 5, and then we're going to talk a little bit about its specifics and hopefully come to a a conclusion where we see that while Jesus is talking about two tough ideas, he's doing it in the context of what it means for us to walk with him. He begins in verse 27, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you would to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman then commits adultery. Woo, okay. The Pharisees sitting in the audience did not like what Jesus just said. You and I might be really uncomfortable with what Jesus just said. Let's wait through this a little bit together so that we understand what Jesus is saying here so that we can find comfort and grow in these things. Uh, there's a famous illustration around this particular topic that I think would be very helpful for us. One night in Jerusalem, King David was walking on the rooftop to cool off and enjoy the evening air and he spotted a beautiful woman on one of the rooftops below. She was bathing. And that makes sense, because that's where all the water cisterns would have been, is up high, because gravity helps in bringing water down into the houses. I can just picture him standing behind the column or kind of hiding behind a palm frond that was planted in one of the planters out on the, the Miranda deck of his palace. And he looks down and he sees her, and what he should have done, he did not do, and instead, he watches. And then he asks the servant, who is that who lives over there? And the servant says, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, one of David's mighty men who was fighting in the war. Well, her being a married woman did not seem to matter to David. And so he asks or summons that she come to the palace. And we don't have the details, but ultimately the king got what he wanted and he sleeps with her. They each go back to their lives and everything is pretty much back to normal until she discovers she's pregnant. She sends word to the king, and she informs him that she is pregnant. His first instinct is to hide the situation. So he calls Uriah back from the front. He says, come and give a report to your king. And so he comes, and David is like, this will be great. He'll come home. He hasn't seen his wife in a month or two. 
what's the, you know, we all know how that's going to turn out, right? Except Uriah is a man of great character. David clearly is not. And what does Uriah do? He sleeps in the servants' quarters. Because if his men cannot come back and enjoy these things, then he should not be able to either. Oh, David's plan is thwarted. The pregnancy is going to be known. And uh, uh, Uriah is going to know that somebody has been with his wife. And David will have to fess up. And this could ruin it. So what does David do? He hatches a better plan to hide his sin. So what he does instead is he sends Uriah back to the front. And he tells the commander of his army, he says, now when everybody pushes, pushes forward, put Uriah on the front, but then call retreat, and he will be left out on his own, and he will be cut down, which is what happens. And he dies. After the appropriate mourning takes place, Bathsheba is sad. Now she's a widow, and David is free to bring her into his household. He marries her, and they raise the child as if nothing had happened, except his sin is known to his friends. And they bring it out. And sin becomes public. And this story teaches us a number of things about adultery that we need to understand this morning. Adultery begins in the eye of the heart. Adultery doesn't begin in an activity. It begins in an impulse to watch, to look, to linger, to contain. Adultery um, is the idea of a married person wanting another married person that they're not married to, uh, essentially. Or a person, it doesn't have to be married, but a person they're not married to. And the net result is wanting, desiring, coveting is, leads to possession, and then you want that person and you, you take it, you go for it. That's what David does, and it gets him into a lot of trouble. Because ultimately, our secret sins will be made public. They will come out. I'm reading this really good book right now for a class I'm taking. It's called Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership. Leaders who are very pronounced, very profound, very wonderful leaders, if they don't deal with their sort of massive personalities, they can be overcome by sin. And many, many great leaders have actually been overcome by sexual sin. And their entire ministries just get destroyed. Ravi Zacharias is probably the most recent name in the news. Some of us uh, remember, um, was it uh, Swagger to a uh, handful of others over the years. Uh, the 80s was rough on TV Christian personalities. The net result of all of that, though, is that essentially what they tried to hide became public, and secret sin will be made public in one way or another. It may come after your death. It may come after your retirement. It may come years later, but it will come out. Or it may come out immediately. Uh, it will come out is the issue. Second, uh, the third thing I want to point out for you, though, is that even if that sin comes out, even as awful as all of that could be, God will forgive. There's no exception to God's forgiveness. He will forgive those who are repentant. Maybe you have sinned. Then you need to seek repentance for sin. David's story as it unfolds also reveals to us that sometimes the consequences of our choices endure even though we've been forgiven. I know people who've had children out of wedlock, and as a result, they've, they've found forgiveness in the Lord, but they still have child. And that child now forever ties them to that relationship, whether they like it or not. And that consequence, and I hate to think of a child as a consequence, there's so much more than that, but in this illustration, that consequence has remained, even though the possibilities of sin has been forgiven. Everybody knew that David's son with Bathsheba came about the way it did. And that child became a living testimony to David's sin, which is a powerful thing to live with through the rest of your life. The fifth idea here is that God can work even in difficult situations. And I always want to end on the positive. I don't want to leave us hanging in the negative. God works even in the storms of our lives. God is working out his plan. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way because, I, oddly enough, the fastest way from A to B in God's kingdom is not always a direct line. So many zigzags and loop-de-loops and, uh, you know, we forgot something and we have to go back to the house and we keep looping back. God's plan, you just, if you were to map the journey of the nation of Israel going from Egypt to the promised land, they could have gotten there much more efficiently, let's just say. 
And yet the Lord had a reason and a purpose. And they didn't notice it. They couldn't see it in the moment. But as we step back and we see the bigger picture, we see God has a plan. Nobody ever wants to hear that in the midst of a storm, okay? That's not very kind to say, well, don't worry, God has a plan. No, my life's in craziness right now. I don't want to hear that. But the reality is all of us will at some point step back and see God is at work, even in really hard stuff, like especially relational hard stuff. So we can trust in that. We can lean into his forgiveness and into his love. And it's important for us to recognize that these are true in our life. David's story illustrates for us that adultery is not something that we should find funny or permissible or exciting or normal. Jesus' words to us uh, affirm the exact same premise, yet just about every romantic comedy from the 90s includes adultery in it. So which is it? Is it funny and permissible and not a big deal? Or is it a grave sin that we need to deal with? Our culture says, enjoy it. God's word says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Commandment number seven, which happens to follow commandment number six. Anybody know that one off the top of your head? Thou shalt not murder. So adultery and murder are kind of hanging out next to each other. It's a big deal. Do you know what happened to adulterers in the Old Testament? capital punishment, they were, they were usually stoned to death. That's awful. Now, oh, that's so bad. She's not married and she had a kid. We better, we better, you know, there's a lot of, that's a grave sin in the eyes of our Lord. Now, I will stand uh, careful here because I don't, I don't know that any one sin is worse than another sin. All sin separates us from the love of God. Little sins, big sins, we're the ones who create that idea. God did not. Sin is sin in his world. But he is quick to forgive, he is quick to love, and he wants us to walk in relationship with him. Our family, our friends, our lives, everything that is us, our souls, are way too precious to allow sins of adultery and other sins to destroy them. We must take action we must guard against sin. We must guard our eyes. We must guard our hands. We must not participate, and we must not be overcome by these things. Jesus clearly does not want you to gouge out your eyes or maim your bodies and start cutting off body parts because you commit sin. These are figures of speech. And But what he's saying is, sin is bad. Deal with it appropriately. We tend to do this. Sin is really bad. Oh, that's too bad. Make better choices right? That's not dealing with sin appropriately. If you are struggling mightily in grave sin, you should be appropriately responding to that sin in a mighty way. And so often we just kind of don't deal with it. And then we wonder like, how come I can't conquer this? How come I can't overcome it? Well, giving lip service to something isn't, isn't equal. It's disproportionate. That's what Jesus is driving at in this statement. He's going to say it again in chapter 19, um, or eight, end of 18 into 19. Jesus is going to say it a couple of times where he's going to say, you know, if you're sitting, cut off the arm, cut off the hand. What he's really saying is remove yourself from the sin. Get that sin out of your life. Be drastic if necessary. I know men who just don't have internet in their lives. That was a drastic step to dealing with something like pornography. I know men who have all kinds of um, uh, governors, uh, all kinds of uh, safety mechanisms on their phones and on tablets and computers. I know um, there are simple little things we can do, right, to help us. Jesus didn't have to deal with the internet. We do. And the internet is a scary, scary place. It's not handled well, right? So for those of us who, who are, uh, for those in our group who struggle with these kinds of things, then we need to have safeguards in place, appropriate to the sin levels that we're dealing with. But so often these things are out of balance. So I would encourage you, just think about that today. Are you struggling in a sin? And if you are, are you dealing with it appropriately? Or have you allowed it to become just, you know, like a 90s rom-com? Yeah, it's fine. It's okay. I'll work out. We want to be careful with that kind of mentality. If we truly desire to deal with sin, we cannot be content with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're back to that context. We must find righteousness in Jesus alone. Because here's the problem with Pharisees. They would say, hey, I'm going to follow all the rules. And they'd say, I'm going to walk right up to the line. 
and I'm just not going to cross it. But I'm going to live right next to it. And the Pharisees would do the right things when people were watching. They would do the right things out of obligation. But it wasn't a matter of their heart. The Lord says, do better. We can do better than that. He says, don't just live by the law. Live by the spirit of the law. What was God's intention for us in marriage? It was that we would be together. In fact, I think that uh, that's why he transitions from adultery to talking about divorce. He wants us to go back to what was the original intention for these relationships to begin with? It wasn't so that we could skirt around all the issues and like the Pharisees, just kind of, you know, make sure we're doing the, you know, mostly the right thing. God says, no, let's go past that. Let's remember what it was all about in the beginning. God created man. It wasn't good. He was alone. He gave him Eve, and together they represented something beautiful and amazing. But you know what God also recognizes? He also recognizes that there is a challenge in this world. Before we jump into the next section where he talks about divorce, I think we need to acknowledge and just remember God's foundational principles for marriage, not what our culture says is the foundation. What does God say? Well, it starts with this. God hates divorce. He literally says it very emphatically. I don't like it. I don't want it. It's not good. It's not helpful. Most people have not walked away from a divorce and thought, I'm going to be better for it. Most times. I, I realize there are difficult circumstances. Matthew 19, Jesus, we're going to get to this later, but Jesus says, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. That's a powerful concept. In fact, um, my slide got out of order, but there are ceremonies where the husband and wife are tied together with knots to represent that they have been joined together. And then the idea is that when they pull on the cord, it cannot be undone. The knot will not unravel. And you're good Boy Scouts and you need to swear not. And uh, yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. And so then what they do instead is they pull that apart and they, they're still joined. And the idea is it cannot be broken. We wear a wedding ring as a symbol of our undying union. That's why it's a circle, right? And so those ideas. So um, Jesus in chapter, or verse 31 of chapter 5, he's basically quoting Deuteronomy 24. Uh, it is also said, whoever divorces his wife must not give her a written notice of divorce. He's quoting this verse, Deuteronomy 24.1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and off she goes. And that verse just carries on to the specific context for why Moses wrote these verses into the law. What the Pharisees grabbed hold of was, oh, you can get a divorce, no problem, just write it on a piece of paper, hand it to her. She can go marry somebody else. She'll be provided for, and you can go on and do your married way, do whatever you want. All of that is predicated on the fact that sin runs rampant in us, and we don't function well in relationships because of sin. And as a result, we needed an out clause. And so what God does instead is he reminds us back to the original. What, is, what did I have in mind originally? Notice what Jesus says. You have heard it said, but then in verse 32 he says, but I'm going to say to you, Everyone who divorces his wife except, he gives us a clause here, in case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And that takes us back to the adultery conversation that we just had. And how do we deal with adultery? Drastically. And so now looking back ahead to the verse 32, we need to understand this moment. According to the Bible, marriage is a lifetime commitment. But what Jesus seems to lay down here is the recognition that there are laws in the Old Testament that are designed to protect divorcees. A woman in Jesus' time who was not married was as good as dead. She was detached. She could not work. She couldn't have income. There were no single women running around out there who were not living in their parents' households. So for a woman to be separated uh, in this way was not only scandalous, but it, her life was in danger. So Moses came up with a system that said, well, we'll write her a certificate that says her divorce was you know, legal, then she can go and get remarried. And what Jesus says is, well, hold on a minute. God doesn't even like divorce. Why are we letting this be a thing? Let's go back to the original thinking here. And so Jesus points us back to that. But Jesus gives us this exception clause, which is a very interesting thing. I want to point out something. People read this passage who love Jesus very, very uh, carefully, and they don't all read it the same. 
There are people who, if you go look at all the other passages about divorce and remarriage, there are people who sort of fall on a spectrum in their views of divorce as they develop a theology of divorce from the New Testament. I want to remind you of that because it's very easy for us to just look at this and think, oh, okay, perfect. There's an exception clause. It's more complicated than that. But I'm not going to go run around and do all of that this morning because we don't have time for that. Nor is I think that what Jesus is getting at here. He says these words not because he's developing a theology of divorce. He, gets, he says these things because he's talking to a people who are living in a culture who are just trying to follow rules and get away with stuff. And he's going to tell us righteousness goes beyond that. We must do the right things for the right reasons because it's a matter of the heart. And so the Greek word here is, is challenging because the word uh, has many meanings. Sexual sin in the Bible is usually linked to the term pornea. Pornea is actually the root word for pornography. It occurs 25 times in 24 locations in our New Testament. So if you were to look this word up and then go read all of those passages, what you would find is a definition word cluster this word is almost always uh, defined as prostitution, unchastity, fornication, adultery, incest, premarital sex, and a whole bunch of words we just don't talk about, right? But the reality is 25 times in the New Testament is actually pretty frequent for such a specialized word to appear. And often it appears in a list of sins that separate us from God, that we need to overcome so that we can have fellowship with the Lord. And that's a key thing, theme that we need to pay attention to. Jesus' teaching about adultery is the idea that the marital knot is being untied. But the allowance of remarriage is not as explicit or as simple as we would like it to be. It's a more complex issue. In Matthew 5.32, the assumption is that the woman who is divorced is likely going to be remarried. So what's the backdrop for Jesus talking about this? His own life. Do you remember Mary and Joseph from chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, which was just a couple pages ago? One of the things we have to be careful of is when we go verse by verse and we stretch out these passages into long periods of time, we lose our, our sense of context for them. But remember, it was just a few pages ago that the writer Matthew told us about Jesus' story and what was Jesus' earthly dad about to do to his mom? Divorce her. Why was he going to do that? Because apparently she had committed adultery. She was pregnant. It wasn't his. And the net result was to divorce her quietly. Why? So she would not be hauled to her father's doorstep and stoned to death. We don't read that in the Christmas story. That's what would have happened to Mary. Very likely. Or Joseph would write her a certificate, releasing her of the marriage, and then she could go and be remarried to somebody else. But there's a child in this situation. So what does God have to do because of the culture and the custom? He literally sends an angel to talk to Mo, uh, Joseph and to talk to Mary because it literally takes a direct um, insertion of the Lord into that story because if it had played out culturally, Jesus probably was never born because his mother would have been stoned before she would have him. That is crazy. And not everybody's going to agree with that line of thinking, but culturally, that's within the realm of possibility. Where does all of that lead us? It leads us back to the, where we're at today. Jesus is talking about the powerful implications of adultery, but he also knows culturally that a woman who is separated from her husband is going to need to get remarried. And so Jesus seems to create this context where there is an allowance because of this issue of adultery on her husband's part, that her second marriage uh, would be able, she'd be released, but then there's this other context where her second marriage, because she's an adulteress, could lead a person into committing adultery with her. That's a really hard contextual statement, and the net result is that what we find is sexual immorality in relationships just complicates everything, and it makes everything difficult, and it is far away from God's original intent of what he's designed in marriage relationships. But God also knows that we have a sin problem. And he did not leave us out in the wind to deal with it by ourselves. So in the greater context of all of these things, it is so important 
that we understand this truth. Even though the Bible makes very clear that God does not like divorce, that he hates it literally. We know that reconciliation is the heart of a believer. That's what the Lord desires for us. He wants the knot that has joined us together to stay tied. God recognizes, though, that it's going to happen among his kids, his children whom he loves. They're going to struggle in their relationships, and divorce could be the result of that. He also knows that when two people separate, they could get remarried. And so he has some words to say about that, and they have to figure all of that out. And all of this boils down to something that I think is very, very important. If you have been or have experienced divorce, God does not love you any less. He loves us all. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Your sin is not worse than others. I, uh, years ago, was teaching on this, and a person asked me, if someone remarries, and it's considered an adulterous relationship based on verse 33, then am I living in perpetual sin? That's an interesting question. I've never really thought about that before. And as I got to thinking about it, it dawned on me, nowhere in the Bible can I think of, or could I find at the time, does it talk about the idea of sin being a habitual, perpetual thing that people live in, other than just sin, humanity's sin problem. And I thought to myself, no, no, we're coming at this from the wrong perspective. The question we need to ask is, if I have all of a sudden understood the Bible and realized that I may find myself in an adulterous relationship through remarriage, is there forgiveness? Yes, yes, there's forgiveness for all of our sin. All of our sin offers us forgiveness. And no, we do not live in perpetual sin. I'm convinced of that. What we need to understand is that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from, and look at that word, all unrighteousness. That's not a qualifying statement other than to say everything falls under it. And what is unrighteousness? The wrong things we do. So I believe the Lord, through just a very simple reading of, of 1 John 1, 9, reminds us that when we confess, Lord, I realize now, maybe I'm in, I, I, I kind of got things out of order, but I've read your word, and now I understand something I didn't understand then. The Lord forgives. The intent here is not to cause problems. The intent here is not to make things difficult. I think a very careful reading of Romans 7 and 8 would really help you understand that if you're feeling that tension today. Uh, and I'd be happy to sit and walk through that with you. I think that's where the answer lies. But some find that they have remarried and that they are all of a sudden questioning, wait, should I have done this? Was it okay that I did this? I want to remind you that the Lord loves you, the Lord forgives you, and he stands ready to give you a better hope and a future for tomorrow. We don't have to uh, struggle and live habitually in these things. What we do need to do, though, is respond to our sin appropriately. So as I close and we draw these things to a uh, point of application, I want to remind you about what Jesus is talking about. We need to go back to the beginning. The Bible's standard of righteousness is absolute perfection. The bad news is, none of us can reach that standard. The good news is, the Lord Jesus knows that, and he did it for us. We have been made righteous by the work of what Christ has done. We celebrated it today at the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper, not to be put in Tupperware. The Lord's Supper reminds us of his body broken, his blood shed, that covers our sin. Christ has atoned for our sin that we may walk with him. And even more, he has enabled us with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to walk in this newness of life, to live in the righteousness that he has paved the way for us. That's the good news. The good news is we don't uh, need to worry about anymore our ability of not being able to achieve righteousness. Instead, we can lean into the truth that God has done it for us. That is why he has made him who had no sin to be sin for us. This is a powerful truth that we must live and walk in in all of our relationships. We have received the precious gift of righteousness from God because of his mercy and his grace. And so don't be the Pharisees. Don't be like them who are just trying to get by, who are trying to live on the to skirt the boundaries, who are trying to just do the good stuff so that people will look upon them and think they're good. We are called by God 
to think back to the beginning, the spirit, the intention of what God wanted for us. And we are in putting on the mind of Christ, endeavoring to learn to walk in his ways. But God also knows stuff happens in our lives. And that doesn't make you less of a loved one in his family. He loves you. He, he cares for you. He desires fellowship and unity in relationship with you. And no divorce is going to wreck that. No difficult relationships in your past is going to destroy that unless you live unrepentant and you refuse to confess sins. That's a problem that's going to be a problem in your life. But if you're willing to acknowledge these things, these hurts, and lean into them with the Lord, then I believe we can live righteously and faithfully because the Lord is transforming us from the inside out to walk in the newness of, of life with him. To do this, we put on the mind of Christ. We live according to his ways, to his laws, with an attitude of faithfulness. So how do we do that? How do we put on this newness? How do we do that? Well, first and foremost, Jesus died for sin. That was an appropriate response to the level of our sin. We must follow his example. If we're struggling in sin, we must respond appropriately. If we sin and just commit a sin, we must respond appropriately. Many people are not in the habit confessing their sin and seeking forgiveness. It's like a 90s rom-com. It'll all work out. It's, Jesus died. It's all, it's all forgiven. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is very clear. If you have sinned, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. We are forgiven and he does forgive. It's an important thing for us to understand. We have an effort to put in to this difficulty. So I would encourage you. I realize I probably opened a can of worms for a lot of people. I realize I've touched on feelings and all kinds of things that maybe you have managed to settle to the bottom and I came in and took my big stick and I stirred it all up into the water column of your life, but now there's all these thoughts floating in your head. You, can, you can't control your emotions. You're going to have emotions. You're going to feel feelings today. But what I want you to do is think carefully about how you respond to those feelings. That you can control. That you can make good choices. If stuff's been stirred up, don't just hope it'll all go away when you wake up tomorrow. Deal with it. Let's, let's wade into it a little bit. I want to help you with that. If you're struggling with a theology or thinking biblically about this concept of divorce, I'm happy to, to weigh into that with you. There's great resources that we can work on together. Here's what I'm not going to claim. I'm not an expert. I don't know everything there is to know. But I do know a lot of people who know a lot of stuff. And we can figure this out together. And when in doubt, look in a book. Books help us. The Lord's word will help us. And I want to encourage you to go on this journey together. Um, Jesus is going to raise a bunch of really hard stuff over the next several weeks for us in his word. It's our job to wade into it and to lovingly work through it. So let's do that together as we close in prayer and our closing song. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your words this morning. May they be a light for us, that we may walk the path of faithfulness and righteousness before you. Lord, we want to do that. It's hard. We live in this world that culturally is just set up to work against us. So, Lord, we just acknowledge that. And we pray that you will help us to walk faithfully and humbly uh, in your word. Lord, Dan reminded us this morning in our, in our call to worship to, to come into your presence, to be ushered into your presence. Lord, it's in your presence that we find uh, forgiveness, that we find healing around these issues. These are hard issues. They're a big deal. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to them and to push into them and to grow and be uh, transformed because we read your word with wisdom and understanding. Lord, nothing in your word is too impossible for us to understand. I pray that your spirit will work in these things and that you will transform us from the inside out. Lord, thank you for your word of truth this morning. It's hard, as challenging as it may be at times. It is, it is good for us. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in us through these things. Lord, um, thank you for our time to worship today. We thank you for those who have come. And Lord, we pray your blessing on us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you all stand with us in this final song?
grace is greater than all of our sins. Because of the work you did on the cross and being raised from the dead. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this time together. In your name, amen. Turn your connected cards in, and the rest of the announcements are on a flyer in the back, so I don't have to list them all off for you, or they're in your email box as well. If you would help stack the chairs, we would really appreciate it for Awana. Oh, and sign up for things. There's all kinds of sign-ups in the back. I saw them all. So potluck, all kinds of things. Have a great week.